We've made some connections up till now between the phase diagram and various thermodynamic quantities. Let's continue to do that and focus in particular on the Gibbs free energy. So I want to come back to the case of benzene and its free energy at one bar of pressure. So let me remind you of uh, a fundamental equation that involves the independent variables for Gibbs free energy. Namely, that dg is equal to minus s, the entropy, dt, plus v, the volume, dp. So we have a phenomenon then that the free energy decreases with increasing temperature, because we know that entropy is always positive for a substance by the third law of thermodynamics. And so if one plots the free energy as a function of temperature, and again, this is a bit of a redux. We've already seen this in module 8, actually you find that as we increase the temperature, the free energy goes down, down, down for the solid. We hit the melting point of the solid, at which point the entropy of the liquid is larger than that of the solid. It continues to decrease with a larger slope because S is a larger number. And then finally, at the boiling point, we go from the liquid to the gas, and so we continue to decrease even more. The curve itself, has to be continuous at the phase transitions because the two phases are in equilibrium with one another, so they have the same free energy. At equilibrium, then, the transition free energy is zero. And what's discontinuous is the slopes because it is the partial derivative of G with respect to T that tells us what the entropy is. And so this slope of G versus T since the entropy of a gas is larger than that of a liquid, is larger than that of a solid, gives rise to this increasingly steeply decreasing free energy with increasing temperature. Now, the diagram that was shown on the last slide in the variation of G would hold in the case of extremely slow changes in temperature, perhaps, where you have time for everything to come into equilibrium. So at the melting point, everything would melt until you had all liquid from all solid previously. And then you would get to a boiling point and everything would boil. It is possible under certain circumstances to observe what are called metastable phases. So if I were to continue the curves, the solid and liquid curves, for example, or the liquid and gas curves, from this point of discontinuity, backwards for the liquid and forwards for the solid, or backwards for the gas and forward for the liquid, I would trace a curve of the liquid at a lower temperature than it would normally exist. That's called a supercooled liquid. Similarly, I can have a liquid that persists even beyond the point at which it's supposed to boil, and that's known, not surprisingly, as a superheated liquid. And so, why might that happen? It turns out that the, the phenomenon of melting or freezing or of boiling or condensing, typically, it, it's actually a, not all that well understood even today. There are various theories about nucleation of solids within liquids, uh, nucleation of liquids within gases, and understanding those nucleation processes is, is an interesting, uh, interesting field of study. Clouds, for instance, are gaseous water that has nucleated in some way, and how do other things in the atmosphere affect that nucleation rate? But in any case, when there are not opportunities to nucleate terribly efficiently, it can be the case that the temperature is changing, but a phase change has not yet occurred. And what then tends to happen is that the phase change occurs very suddenly when somewhere a nucleation opportunity or a nucleation event happens, and the whole rest of the system very, very quickly, in the case of a supercooled liquid, goes to a solid. Poof. Uh, much more dangerous uh, in, in the kitchen, for example, is the case of a supercooled liquid going to a gas rather suddenly. And so that's why in the laboratory, when we boil liquids out on the bench, which we try not to do all that much in, in the first place, uh, often one will add something called a boiling stone, for example, which has lots of little sharp edges on it to facilitate nucleation of gas bubbles that then bubble out of solution and make sure that you don't have a spontaneous poof, lots of liquid suddenly becomes very hot vapor. 
Now that's uh, talking about temperature dependence. What about pressure dependence? So if we plot the free energy as a function of pressure, what we find is as we increase the pressure, the free energy goes up, up, up if we're starting from a gas until we eventually get to the point where the pressure is so high it condenses the gas to a liquid and the free energy continues to go up. And then finally we can compress it to a solid. And again, I could draw uh, metastable phase curves by continuing these curves, again, if nucleation is not kinetically efficient. So this particular curve, if you like, is represented on the phase diagram of benzene by this brown line. So I've begun at some low pressure and a given temperature. So here I have some fixed temperature, and in fact, I've chosen a temperature above the triple point, so that matters. So here I am above the triple point. I increase my pressure up, 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 up. I eventually hit the gas liquid coexistence curve. So I switch over to a liquid, that's right here. I keep going up, up, up. I hit the solid liquid coexistence curve. And benzene is not like water. So even though that line looks vertical, it has a very slight positive slope. So eventually I can increase the pressure enough that I will cross that line and I'll go from liquid to solid. Now, in fact, if you look at this brown line on the diagram, it obviously tilts a little bit to the left. And that, that, that would formally mean the temperature is changing. I don't want the temperature to change. This is a constant temperature. I've only done that in order to allow the eye to see that, sure enough, it crosses this coexistence curve, and then it crosses that coexistence curve. Unfortunately, this line is so near vertical, it's, it's hard to get all that on, on one actual slide. So that's just a, a trompe l'oeil, if you will. We can look at a different uh, substance along those lines, and that might be water just below the triple point. So once again, if I focus here on the water phase diagram, looks a lot like benzene with the exception that this solid liquid coexistence curve now has a negative slope. But once again, it's kind of hard to see on the scale of this diagram, so I've bent my brown line a little bit to show you how the curves would be crossed. And you see that you would go from a gas to a solid at this temperature, to a liquid eventually. And so here we have that free energy as a function of pressure, gas transferring to solid, solid now being the, the lowest free energy phase, going to liquid. And so remembering the, the, relation, the thermochemical relationship between free energy and pressure, the change in the free energy with respect to a change in pressure is the volume. And so if we take molar quantities, the change in the molar free energy with respect to pressure is the molar volume of the phase. And that, that change here, dGdp, that's the slope within this diagram. So what we have here is that the volume of the phase is very large for a gas. That slope is very large. And that's what we know for gases. They occupy a lot of volume. And then the volume becomes smaller for the liquid and it is smallest for the solid in the case of benzene. So that's one of the cases where you compress to the solid, unlike water. So these slope magnitudes just depend on the substance. Uh, the nature of the substance dictates what the molar volumes are and uh, understanding how these relate to the phase diagrams is really just sort of becoming familiar with manipulating all these different approaches to represent the interdependence of these multiple variables. So here's an opportunity to try that out with a self-assessment, a variety of different free energy versus pressure diagrams. Try to correlate each one of those with an associated phase diagram. <clears throat> All right, here are the answers to that self-assessment. Maybe pause and take a moment to internalize them and make sure it looks good to you, and we'll move on. And in this case, moving on simply is advertising the next lecture in the series, when we're going to take a look at chemical potentials and something called the Clapeyron equation.